Okay, I think uh, we'll make a start now. Today's lecture is about uh, iron alloys. These are possibly the most successful of all materials. The amount of uh, iron alloys consumed every year is in excess of about 1.3 billion tons. And there are a variety of reasons for the success of iron and its alloys. The prime reason being that you can generate actually an infinite variety of microstructures in it. Now, you're familiar with two allotropic forms of iron. One is the body-centered cubic phase, often called ferrite. And then we have the cubic close packed or austenite phase, which exists at higher temperatures, above uh, 910 degrees centigrade in pure iron. But there are many other allotropic forms of iron which I can't go into today. And it is the transformations between these two forms which govern the properties of most alloys of iron. Now, the change in crystal structure between the high temperature phase and the low temperature phase can occur by a number of mechanisms. And in the last lecture, we looked at one particular mechanism, which was martensitic transformation. So imagine that this is our alloy of iron, and we have you know, square atoms and round atoms, so iron atoms and manganese atoms, for example. One way in which I can change the crystal structure without any diffusion is that I deform the unit cell into another shape. So here, we are simply shearing this unit cell into the new shape. When I do that, the consequence is that the macroscopic shape of the crystal must change because the atoms are moving in a disciplined manner. That causes a lot of strain energy, and that's why the product will always be in the form of a thin plate. Second consequence is that if you look over here, the neighbors of atoms remain the same. In other words, we are not changing the order in which the atoms are arranged. So this retains a memory of the arrangement of atoms in the parent phase. And that's why when we reverse the transformation, we get a reversal of any shape change. And that's our shape memory metal that we did in the last lecture. So there is no diffusion involved in a transformation like this. The chemical composition in this region is exactly the same as here. And there is an atomic correspondence between the atoms here and here. Now, the second mechanism of changing the unit cell is that we break all the bonds and we rearrange the atoms into the new pattern, allowing diffusion to happen so that we don't change the external shape of our crystal. So, for example, when water solidifies to ice, we don't actually change the shape of the container. There might be a volume change, but that's about all. So here, what we do is we break all the bonds, we rearrange the atoms in the new cell, and the external shape of our material remains the same because we've allowed flow to occur and cancel out things like this. So imagine that if we transform like this, we then cut this triangle and transport it onto this side. That cancels any strain. Okay? So that cutting operation where I take this triangle here, transport it onto this side, is the diffusion that's necessary. So these kinds of transformations can only happen when we have sufficient atomic mobility. And notice also that we've lost all atomic correspondence because these particular atoms prefer to be in the product lattice, so they migrate into the product lattice. So we might, for example, get an enrichment of these square atoms in this region. So in a, in a transformation which is reconstructive, that means we break all the bonds, rearrange the atoms into the new pattern, there must be diffusion, minimal strain energy, and the product phase does not necessarily have the same chemical composition as the parent, because the atoms move into the phase where they prefer to be. Okay. Is everybody happy with these two mechanisms of transformation? Here, the shape can be anything determined, for example, by minimization of surface energy. Yeah, it need not be a plate shape. Here, the shape of the transformation product must be a plate. So every time you see a plate-shaped product, it's likely to have formed by this mechanism, which involves systematic displacements. Okay. So let's look at a, a few examples 
of these two mechanisms of transformation. And I'm going to start off with this reconstructive mechanism, which requires a lot of diffusion. <clears throat> so it can only happen at temperatures in iron above approximately 600, 500 degrees centigrade. Now, this is uh, a, a part of the iron carbon phase diagram. Carbon has a profound effect on the properties of iron, and I'll explain why it has a profound effect. And this is a eutectoid reaction in which the austenite here will decompose into a mixture of ferrite and cementite. And cementite is simply a compound of iron and carbon, Fe3C, orthorhombic crystal structure, uh, illustrated here. Austenite is our cubic close back phase, and ferrite is the body centered cubic phase. If I have uh, an alloy of this composition exactly, the eutectoid composition, then as I cool the austenite, nothing will happen until I get to this temperature, and then the austenite begins to decompose into a mixture of ferrite and cementite. If I have an alloy which is hypo eutectoid, then I will first get the formation of ferrite, and as I cool, the composition of the austenite moves along this phase boundary, that of the ferrite along there, and eventually the remaining austenite decomposes into this mixture of ferrite and cementite. Now, why am I using the word eutectoid instead of eutectic? This is a solid state transformation. If, if it was a liquid going to two solid phases, that would be a eutectic. Now, I said to you that carbon has a profound effect on the properties of iron, but it isn't completely a true statement. It has profound effect on the properties of body-centered cubic iron, not the cubic close-packed iron. And to understand that, we need to look again at our dislocation. A dislocation, when it moves, it causes shear. If you examine the strain fields around the dislocation, because you can see these lattice planes are all bending, then most of that strain field is a shear strain field. That's logical, because after all, a dislocation causes shear. But there is a small volume change as well, because after all, you know, the packing in this region is not ideal. Okay, so, so the dislocation strain field consists of mainly of shears, and there is a small hydrostatic component, that means a volume change. Now, if you look at the location of carbon atoms in the cubic close-packed lattice, then they are located in these octahedral holes. So this is our iron atom, and that's a carbon atom, and it's located in this nice octahedral hole in the austenite. And that is a regular octahedron, that means when you put a carbon atom into that interstice, it will cause a uniform expansion. Okay. In other words, a volume change. Now, a volume change cannot interact with shear strains. Okay. So this carbon atom in austenite only weakly interacts with dislocations with the hydrostatic component of a dislocation strain field. So the amount of strengthening we get from carbon in austenite is quite small. It's like substitutional strengthening, where supposing I replace the iron atom by a manganese atom, it only causes a volume change. So a volume change cannot interact with the shear strain field of a dislocation. And a screw dislocation only has shear strain fields. So the strengthening caused by carbon atoms in austenite is quite weak. <clears throat> now just to show you that this octahedral hole is exactly the same as an octahedral hole here. Okay, you can see, once again, this is a regular octahedron. The distance between there and there is the same as the distance between there and there. I'm now going to show you the corresponding slide for a carbon atom in ferrite. This is an octahedral hole in a body-centered cubic lattice. And the distance between this carbon atom and this iron atom is different from the distance between this and this. 
So although this is a, an octahedron, it's not a regular octahedron. It actually has a long axis and two short axes. Okay. Oh, so, sorry, two long axes and one short axis. So it causes an asymmetrical distortion. It's actually a tetragonal distortion. And that, of course, can interact with shear strain fields. Okay. So a carbon atom in ferrite will cause an immense amount of hardening because it interacts with the shear components of the strain field of dislocation and also, of course, the hydrostatic component. So a very small concentration of carbon has a huge effect on the strength of body-centered cubic ferrite. And this is just to show you that this site here is exactly equivalent to this because look, this atom here is the same as this here and this distance is the same as this. Okay. So in your notes, I've actually drawn the locations of the carbon atoms in body-centered cubic ferrite. So we now understand why carbon causes a great deal of hardening in ferrite, but not in austenite. Okay. Now, of course, uh, if because carbon causes a very large strain, the solubility of carbon in ferritic iron is quite small. Maximum solubility under equilibrium is about 0.02 weight percent. However, if we take austenite, the solubility is much higher because the distortion caused by carbon is much smaller. So if we start with austenite and rapidly cool it so that we get martensitic transformation. I'm sorry about that noise, okay? Um, so that we get martensitic transformation, no diffusion at all. Then the ferrite will inherit all the carbon from the parent phase. And we get martensite. So you can force the carbon to stay inside the ferrite by having a diffusion-less transformation, martensite. But because carbon has such a huge strengthening effect on body-centered cubic iron, this martensite will be very, very hard, extremely strong, and unfortunately, brittle at the same time. So you can see this is a plate of martensite and it's full of cracks. These cracks form as you cool the material rapidly to obtain martensitic transformation. This is an unetched sample, and you can see lots and lots of cracks there. So we can't use a material which contains cracks. Okay? So what we do is we, first of all, use a carbon concentration which doesn't lead to cracks, but it's still super saturated, and then we temper the martensite to allow some of that carbon to precipitate as carbides. Now, tempering it simply means that you heat treat the material, uh, say, for example, at 200 degrees centigrade for an hour, so that the carbon has an opportunity to escape from the lattice of the martensite and form precipitates of carbide, uh, precipitates of cementite. If you temper at a higher temperature, then, of course, you start to get recovery and recrystallization and so on. So if you follow the hardness, of martensite in an iron carbon alloy, as you temper, at first there are very gentle changes because diffusion is slow and all these precipitation, recovery, recrystallization processes take a lot of time. Once you get towards the temperatures where substitutional atom diffusion becomes significant, you get a rapid drop in hardness. So we are, we are losing strength, but we are gaining in terms of toughness. Toughness is the ability of the material to absorb energy before fracture. Now, supposing that instead of just having carbon as a solute, we also have elements like molybdenum or chromium or vanadium, all of which are strong carbide-forming elements. That means they have a strong affinity for carbon. Then. At a temperature, okay, so if we have substitutional elements inside our material, then at a temperature when diffusion becomes significant, that means around five or 600 degrees centigrade, they are stronger carbide formers than iron, and they will precipitate 
alloy carbides, for example, molybdenum carbide or vanadium carbide or chromium carbide. And those carbides are extremely fine and they have coherency with the matrix and therefore they cause hardening. So you can see we get a, an increase in, uh, in um, hardness as we temper the material. So this is known as secondary hardening because the first hardening comes from forming the martensite. Then we get this drop in hardness as the carbon leaves uh, the martensite and precipitates as iron carbides. And then we get the alloy carbides coming in, which are very fine and have coherency strains. And we get an increase in hardness. So just to show you the microstructures, this is when we just have iron carbon. And you can see that the cementite particles, the Fe3C, are, are pretty coarse because they form essentially at a rate controlled by carbon getting out of martensite. Okay. So it's, uh, it doesn't give much to the strength of the material if you have coarse particles. You want fine particles, finely dispersed throughout the material. By contrast, uh, so notice this scale over here. This is one micrometer. If you look at molybdenum carbides, you know, look at the scale now, 200 nanometers, these are extremely fine particles, very, very fine. And it's, it's clear to see these in a dark field image. They are beautiful, coherent with the matrix, and very finely dispersed. Plenty of obstacles to dislocation movement, so we get this secondary hardening effect. And of course, we've removed most of the carbon from solid solution in the martensite, and therefore this is not brittle. Furthermore, the big advantage of secondary hardening is that this microstructure will be stable at high temperatures. Okay. It's been generated by tempering at high temperatures, so it will be stable at high temperatures. So these are the kinds of steels that we use to construct, for example, power stations, where the steam temperature may be about 600 degrees centigrade, and the steel has to survive that temperature for something like 30 years of service. You need a stable microstructure, which actually has been generated at a high temperature. <coughs> Everyone happy with secondary hardening? <clears throat> OK. <clears throat> now, can somebody tell me what this microstructure is? OK, it's, it's in, a, in a eutectoid steel. Sorry? Perlite. Perlite. And what does perlite consist of? Yeah, so, so you, can, you have been told in the past that perlite consists of layers of ferrite and cementite, okay? And you can see that in this two-dimensional section uh, that we have these layers of ferrite and cementite. <clears throat> and of course, uh, a eutectoid composition is exactly like this, about 0.8 weight percent carbon, and the time temperature transformation diagram for your tectolite steel will be very simple. If I take my austenite and I cool it to any particular temperature and hold it, I will get perlite. If I cool it sufficiently rapidly, then I can miss the perlite and just get martensitic transformation. So on this diagram, this horizontal line represents the formation of martensite. So I've got to cool the steel fast enough to avoid perlite in order to get martensitic transformation. If I do something which shifts this curve to longer times, then that steel is said to be more hardenable because you can cool at a slower rate to get martensite. Okay? And for, for example, if I add anything which makes austenite more stable than ferrite, that will increase the hardenability of the steel. So manganese, for example, stabilizes austenite relative to ferrite, and this curve would move to the right and I would require a much slower cooling rate to achieve martensite. So that's the essential uh, feature of a time temperature transformation diagram. As soon as I get below this eutectoid temperature, I will be able to generate perlite. The reaction will be slow over here because the driving force is small. It will be slow over here because diffusion becomes slow and there's this optimum temperature at which the rate of reaction is fastest. Of course, if I have a steel which is not of eutectoid composition, but hypo-eutectoid, then first I must get ferrite. 
And it's only when the austenite reaches this composition that it will decompose into perlite. And here is an example of a hypoeutectoid steel, where these are the layers of ferrite which form at the austenite grain boundaries, which are heterogeneous nucleation sites. And as they grow, they reject carbon because you can see the solubility of carbon in ferrite is much less than the solubility in austenite. So they reject carbon, so the remaining austenite becomes richer in carbon and then decomposes into this fine perlite. Okay. Now, going back to this slide again, I'm just about to explain to you that this notion that perlite consists of alternating layers of ferrite and cementite isn't strictly correct. And it comes from the fact that we are observing two-dimensional sections. The three-dimensional structure is quite different. Uh, this is a misleading micrograph. Uh, before I show you the three-dimensional structure, one of the major applications of perlite is in rail steels. The vast majority of railway lines are made from perlitic steels. And they, they are very strong because you can make the distance between the cementite and ferrite smaller and smaller by transforming at a lower temperature, and you get extreme strength, which is good for wear resistance. But they are not tough. They can break easily if, for example, the temperature falls. So this is an extract from Dr. Zhivago. Obviously, you may not have seen this movie. It comes from about the 1950s. But look, there is this Russian engineer saying that, you know, the rails crack in frosty weather. So perlite is strong, but it doesn't have toughness. And why doesn't it have toughness, even though the scale of the microstructure is very fine? Well, it's because in three dimensions, the structure of perlite is not actually alternating layers. I want you to imagine that this cabbage is the cementite. So, you know, all the leaves of the cabbage are connected in three dimensions. So that's like a single crystal of cementite. Okay? You then put it into a bucket of water, and the water is the single crystal of ferrite. So what we have is not really an extremely fine structure, but an interpenetrating bicrystal of ferrite and cementite, whose dimensions are not the spacing between the leaves, but actually the size of an individual colony of perlite, okay? So the toughness really depends on this scale, not on the distance between the leaves, because if the crystallography is the same here, then a crack can simply propagate undeviated. So perlite is not as tough as it should be because the interlamellar spacing isn't what controls toughness. It's the size of the entire colony, which is a bicrystal of ferrite and cementite. So about 10 years ago, we looked at this problem in our, in our department, and we designed a completely different concept for rail steels. Yeah, the microstructure, as you can see, is quite different. This is a microstructure consisting of plates, so that gives you a clue that this has formed by a displacive mechanism. However, it's not martensite. It's something that we call bainite. Okay, and I'll explain to you what bainite is uh, in, uh, shortly. But if you look at the performance of this quite new microstructure, in terms of fatigue properties of railways, it beats anything that exists by a huge amount. And even the tests had to be stopped here because they are going on for too long. So it survives a, a phenomenon known as fatigue where you know, every time a wheel passes over a rail, it induces stresses and slowly the material cracks up. This new microstructure is capable of sustaining fatigue to much longer lifetimes than any of the previous rail steels. And similarly, if you look at the wear rate, you know, every time a wheel passes on a rail, again, it rubs off some material. Incredibly small, both on the wheel and the rail. So this is now in commercial production, okay? So a new kind of a rail doesn't contain any cementite at all. It's simply a mixture of ferrite and austenite, and the phase concerned is bainite. So this is now a time-temperature transformation diagram 
for a hypo eutectoid steel. That means it's not of the eutectoid composition. So when we transform it at a high temperature, we will first get those layers of ferrite at the austenite grain boundaries. If you transform it here, we will get perlite. And there is this region here where we have this phase called bainite, which consists of very fine plates, which are formed by a displacive mechanism of transformation. So you might ask, you know, what is the difference between bainite and martensite? Well, if you look at your time temperature transformation diagram, the bainite forms at a somewhat higher temperature than martensite. But it is actually martensite. It forms exactly like martensite. But because we are at a slightly higher temperature, the carbon then escapes out of the plate of bainite into the surrounding austenite and precipitates as cementite. So this is what we call an upper bainite microstructure, forms at a relatively higher temperature. Here, the carbon diffusion is slower. So you get some precipitation inside the plates and some precipitation between the plates from the austenite, and this is lower bainite. But essentially, this is martensite, but it forms at a temperature where the carbon can redistribute. We don't have to temper. This tempers automatically. Okay? While it is forming, it tempers itself, which is very nice. Okay? You don't have to give a separate heat treatment. So bainite is essentially martensite, but it tempers as it grows. The carbon escapes, precipitates, etc. Everyone clear about that? Okay. So it's simply a displacive transformation which tempers as the transformation progresses. I wanted to show you this very latest development. Okay? This is the first ever bulk nanostructured metal. It's incredibly cheap because it's based on iron. Look at the scale here. These plates are 20 nanometers in size. So this is a particular form of bainite that we have created by transforming at a temperature which is lower than that at which you cook pizzas. Okay? So you typically cook a pizza at about 220 degrees centigrade. This is obtained below that transformation temperature. So it's inconceivable that there is any diffusion of substitutional atoms. And in a bulk sample, that means it's big in all three dimensions, we have nanocrystalline Bainite here, 20 nanometers in size, incredibly strong, because the finer you make the structure, the stronger it is. And it is very, very tough. That means it can absorb energy. So it has all the characteristics required. It's very strong. It's very, very tough. It has uh, minimal cost. You know, there's nothing special about its chemical composition. You can produce it using standard technology. So this is now have, making a, a big impact on critical applications. So for example, we are working on improving aero engines using this material. There's already major applications in armor. Yeah, this outperforms many forms of armor that exist at the moment. If you want to learn more about this, then there is an exhibition in the Science Museum where they've colored this picture. So this is exactly that picture, but they've added some artificial color. So if you go to the Science Museum in London, there is a big display about this. There's also a 100-year experiment, because we've designed another form of bainite, which will take about 100 years to form. Okay. But it will be incredibly fine. So that experiment is in progress in the Science Museum. So maybe, maybe you know, your children can see the result, whether it will actually form in 100 years. OK, going back to this diagram, uh, we've covered ferrite, we've covered perlite, we've covered martensite and bainite. And there is this strange thing here, Weidmannstein ferrite. What is it? Well, I've talked about martensitic transformations involving a disciplined movement of atoms. Now, imagine that we have a queue of soldiers here, and the military transport arrives. They are ordered to board the bus, and they do so in a highly disciplined and coordinated manner, so that there's a complete correspondence between positions of soldiers here and in the queue. You know, that's exactly the atomic correspondence that I was talking about. Furthermore, uh, they may have to sit next to people they don't like. Yeah? So there's a lot of strain energy involved in a disciplined movement of atoms. Okay, so 
Modern static transformations are often called military transformations. By contrast, we have a queue of civilians. As soon as the bus arrives, they all rush on board. They sit next to their friends. We've lost all atomic correspondence, and there's minimal strain energy. So this is called a civilian transformation. And ferrite and perlite are civilian transformations. They're close to equilibrium. There is a third variety, and it's unique to steels. That is that we have these tiny atoms, carbon atoms, which are mobile even though the large atoms may not be. So we can have a displacive transformation as far as the large atoms are concerned. That means we change the crystal structure by a displacive mechanism. But these diffuse and occupy positions which make them happiest. So this is pa uh, called a paramilitary transformation. And Wiedmannstein ferrite. First of all, you can see it forms as plates, okay, fairly coarse plates. And that gives you a clue that it's a displacive transformation. If you polish the sample completely flat and allow this to form, you will see the displacements on the surface. So that's consistent. But this displacive transformation happens at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon. Okay? So the carbon is never inherited by the Wiedmannstein ferrite. It's partitioning as the transformation happens. So this is a displacive transformation which is slow. Okay. It occurs at a rate controlled by the diffusion of carbon atoms, and it's a true paramilitary transformation. The carbon atoms are diffusing, but the large atoms are not. Okay. Now, I hope I've given you an inkling of the complexity of iron and its alloys, and this is just touching the surface. There's a huge number of phase changes that we can have. I haven't even talked about the magnetic properties of iron. And without the magnetic properties, the iron would actually be hexagonal close-packed at room temperature, and we would have very poor mechanical properties. We essentially wouldn't have civilization as we know it, because you, know, you just try to remove steel from your life, and you'll see the problems that arise. So there's a lot more about this, which can't be covered in this course, but it's an absolutely fascinating subject. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you, and uh, see you on Saturday.